Hello. Just gathering my leaves. Need to go out and get another piece of plantain. The plantain in my garden are going to be like, why? Why do you hate us? You've just been harvesting us for the last three days. This has never happened before. It's so beautiful out there and so cold. <laughs> okay, I got my leaves. You got your leaves? Got my blade of grass. Doesn't matter if you haven't, does it? You can just use mine. Okay, one nose blow, and I think we're good to go, you know? has just brought tiny person back from the doctors but it's fine that's good isn't it okay right nose is blown cardion and then i'm flipping you <laughs> all right you ready of course you are you've been ready for ages let's do this bum ba -da bum Hello everybody, hello. My name is Lara, I am trained to teach science to secondary school people. You are the Science Alliance. It's lesson six of thinking scientifically. Um, so today we're looking at classifying. What is classifying? Why is it important? Um, actually, let's just think about that for a second, okay? Because there's so much beautiful stuff on earth, yeah? I'm, I'm lucky, I can see into my garden right now. I can see trees, grass, uh, clouds in the sky, a wooden climbing frame, a plastic child's bicycle. There's so much cool stuff in the world. Imagine that we just landed on planet Earth. Um, why would we want to categorise things? Why would we put, want to put things into different categories and class them as different things? Why? Ten seconds, why? Why is it important? So there are loads and loads of, loads of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is, which a few people were saying on Facebook the other day, uh, was, was so that we like 
know what each thing is, to help us understand each thing better. So imagine you've just been bitten by a snake. You know, need to know which snake it is, yeah? You need to know whether it's one of those ones that you're gonna die within seconds and you have gotta get to hospital, or whether you've just got a cut on your leg and it's fine. But you don't know that unless we've named that specific snake. Um, which means we have to classify, yeah? We have to know the difference between one snake and another snake. It's also very useful for um, working out which, spa which species are particularly endangered. Like if you, you know what an animal is, then you can count it and you can work out if it's in trouble. Um, we're not just gonna, we're mainly gonna talk about classifying animals because that's kind of the fun bit. But first of all, I've just got you a big list of just stuff, things found on earth, and I want you to put them into three different categories for me, please. Here we are. I've got uh, gravity pulling you down to earth. Oops, like it's pulling down my mobile phone holder right now. A worm, some chalk, pulling a string, concrete, two magnets pulling towards each other, a palm tree, a fossil, a grain of sand, a spider, a mushroom, bacteria, volcanic rock, the friction of your welly stopping you from going down a slide, we've all been there, and air particles pushing against a parachute and making you fall slowly. Just put them into three categories. You don't, well, yeah, name the categories. Go on, give the categories names. How are you going to put those things into three groups? I'm not going to give you that long. What do you think? 20 seconds? Ten seconds, and then I'm going to teach you a very important word that you need to remember to pass your GCSE question at the end of this lesson. Five, four, anyone having a little debate over fossil? Three, which category are you going to put fossil in? Two, one, okay, well this is what I did, probably what you did. The rock, the chalk, the concrete, and a, a fossil and a grain of sand. I've said are all, yeah, well, I've said solids. They're all geological, yeah? They're all not living. I mean, a fossil is a trace of something that was living, but strictly speaking, a fossil is, is now just kind of, you know, rock particles that aren't alive. Uh, the next one is the word that I want you to remember. Uh, organisms. Organisms is a very handy thing for living things. So some people were categorising these on Facebook yesterday as animals, but obviously a palm tree, a mushroom isn't an animal, but they are all alive. And an organism is a super useful word to describe anything that's alive, like moss, bacteria, a dog, you know. Uh, and these ones, they're all forces actually. I'm a physics teacher, so uh, just like this is the only time we're going to talk about something that isn't a plant or an animal because the rest of the lesson's biology but i wanted to show you how basically um science being a scientist just seems to be picking which thing you want to be in which category you want you're interested in and then just categorizing all the stuff in that category and just categorizing again and again and again and again until you've only got one very specific thing left to learn about so i've got all the forces that you've hopefully put into a forces category um Physicists categorise forces as contact and non-contact. You know what contact means? Like touching. So I'm not going to tell you anything else. Just have a look again at these forces and see if you can put the forces into now two different categories. Contact force and non-contact force. Which do you think is a contact force? Like a touching force? And which one is a non-touching force? So gravity pulling you down to earth. Imagine you're you're, you find yourself in the sky and you get pulled down to earth by gravity. Is it a contact force or is it a non-contact force? Pulling on a string with your fingers, contact or non-contact. Air particles pushing against a parachute and making you fall slowly. Two magnets pulling towards each other and the friction of your welly stopping you from going down the slide. Which one's a contact, which one's a non-contact? Just 10 seconds because it's only brain exercise, it's not a physics lesson, is it? Three, two. If you just joined us, welcome. We haven't got on to the main bit of the lesson, which is leaves. We're going to do that in a sec. And one. Okay, what do you reckon? Well, pulling on a string is a contact force. Yeah, you have to touch the string. Um, two magnets pulling towards each other, that's a non-contact force. You imagine the pens are magnets. You can tell, can't you? You move magnets towards each other and you start to feel a pull. The magnets don't need to be touching. Um, gravity is another non-contact force. You don't need to be on Earth to feel the effects of gravity. But air particles pushing against the parachute, that's a contact force and the friction of UNEs, that's a contact force. So uh, it doesn't matter at all if you didn't get those right, but just to show you that scientists classify and 
categorize everything doesn't even have to be a living thing um and yes we'll we'll for the rest of the lesson we're going to look at leaves now and then we'll look later at animals so i said that you might want to go out and collect some leaves before this lesson it doesn't matter at all if you haven't done it i'm going to proudly show you my leaf collection here and then i've put some on the board actually if you've got the worksheet for my facebook group it doesn't matter if you didn't but if you did you might want to start cutting out the pictures of leaves that i gave you now and seeing if you can put those into different categories so here we go i have with me the what my husband calls the ugliest plant he's ever seen i rescued an aloe vera from a charity shop but it's it's important for science that you look at it look oh so squidgy and spiky right let's have a look at that one here's another one here's another dandelion this is uh, what i as a physics teacher would call a leaf this one here uh, that's another more roundy leaf uh, that's a plantain leaf, a weed that you find in your garden. It's rather beautiful. Can you see a difference between this plantain leaf and this other, what I would call, yeah, a normal leaf? There's this one that's like three leaves coming off the same bit. Some of them are red, some of them are green. There's some moss. Just ignore that guy. Uh, right, here's the pictures then. If you haven't got any in front of you, you can use these pictures. How would you split these leaves into two categories, please? I've said if you've got the sheet, you could just write A or B next to them or split them up, put them in different piles. I've given you this little diagram because you need to know the words for things to be able to describe them, don't you? The bits we really need to talk about are the line down the middle, which is called the midrib, and the little lines off the sides, which are the veins. So the, the long bit through the middle of a leaf, most leaves have them, not all of them, is the midrib and the bits coming off of the veins. How are you going to put these leaves into different categories? I've got big aloe vera, uh, a cheese plant leaf with lots of holes in, a leaf, <laughs> a, a leaf that is kind of five small leaves attached to one big, uh, that's a, yeah, one big stem, another leaf, I don't know, they're all just leaves aren't they, but this is what I mean, like a biologist who'd chosen to study leaves would not just see leaves, they'd see all kinds of subtle differences that, that I can't see. Right, I'm just going to be silent and give you, what, like 15 seconds. Look at the mid, obviously there's loads of different ways you can categorise them. Look at the midrib and look at the veins and see if you come up with anything. It's super hard. I don't, I don't think you'll get it, but there is a way that biologists split these leaves into just two categories. Shall I show you? It's the difference between like that one and that one. I'll show you. So what scientists do is they talk about monocots and dicots. Monocots are leaves where the veins are parallel, like running alongside each other, like uh, train tracks. And dicots are leaves where the lines, the veins aren't parallel, the veins come off at different angles, all right? So to give you an idea, um, this leaf with five different leaves coming off it, that's a dicot because those veins aren't parallel, yeah? Um, that one next to it, which pretty much looks exactly the same as far as I'm concerned, is also a dicot. Dicots are what I think a non-scientist would call the normal leaves, the one with the midrib going up the middle and then veins coming off the side. The monocots are parallel, so um, a blade of grass is a monocot, and um, a plantain certainly looks like a monocot leaf. A cheese plant is got lots of holes in, but it's still just kind of a normal leaf. This one's a bit weird. What do you reckon, monocot or dicot? It's got kind of vein, veins coming up that are sort of parallel, but they are still coming off the midrib. So that one would be a, uh, a dicot. But yeah, plantains, it turns out, are actually dicot. Oh, it's so confusing. Right, so look, here we go. You've got... This is a plantain leaf. It's it's a monocot leaf, but it's a dicot plant. I just show. I hope I'm not doing your head in. I'm just telling you, just trying to show you how confusing it is. It turns out there's monocots and there's dicots. So flowering plants, get off me. Flowering plants are by far the most like popular plant on planet Earth. Most plants are flowering plants, and we split those into two categories: the monocots and the dicots. One of the ways, one of the things on the tick list for a dicot 
is if it has a midrib with veins normally coming off it. And one of the things on the tick list for a monocot is the veins are parallel. But it's not the only thing. If you plant a rice seed, which you should, just plant a wholemeal grain of rice. It's gorgeous. What will happen as it sprouts is just one little leaf will come off. And it's the same if you plant a piece of sweet corn. Do it, plant some popcorn. Uh, one little leaf comes off. So that, that is also, again, one of the definitions of a monocot. And dicots are what us non-biologists would call like the, the normal seedling with the double leaf. That's a dicot. But it turns out there's no one easy way to tell. You've got a checklist of about five weird and wonderful biological things that you have to tick off to decide whether something's a monocot or a dicot. It's never as easy as it as just looking at it. And now it's a lot easier for scientists because we can look at a plant or an animal's DNA, like their proteins in their body, what they're made up of. And that gives us loads of information about how they were related. You might have said that's another important way, reason that we classify things to work out like their evolutionary background. Um, moss is not a monocot or a dicot, it evolved before flowering plants evolved, but it's still a plant because it still uses sunlight to make its own food. That's the definition of plant. All right, shall we move on then to how you categorize, classify all organisms, plants and animals and bacteria, blessum and fungi. I'm gonna show you uh, this, you've almost certainly heard of some of these words, and we'll talk about what they mean. So here we go. Um, these are the different groups, the kingdom, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and then right at the bottom, the species. You've probably heard of at least the animal kingdom. You might not have heard of the plant kingdom. What does this mean? Well, someone called Carl Linnaeus, I think that's how you pronounce it, was one of the first people to look at living things, organisms, and think, I reckon I can sort this out. Like, I can see that some of them are kind of related, some of them are less related. So he came up with this system of there are, it's different in England and America. Some people say there's five kingdoms, some people say there's six. But anyway, um, we'll just talk about three. There are different kingdoms, big categories that you can put living things into. So one of the kingdoms is animal. And one is plant, and one is uh, fungi. These are the ones that we've all heard of, so we'll, we'll just work with those. So they're all different kingdoms. So straight away, everything we've just looked at, the monocots and the dicots and the moss, they would all be in the plant kingdom. And animals are obviously all in the animal kingdom, and if it's a mushroom or a toadstool or something like that, or mould, it's in the fungi kingdom. But obviously animals and plants, like all animals are very different, right? So he also split the animals and the plants and the fungi into different groups. And those are called the phylums. Phyla, the phylum, we're talking Latin here, so it's phylum. So animals, you might have a phylum of animals that have backbones. I'll give you the posh word for them in a moment, like vertebrates. You can split animals in the animal kingdom into animals that have backbones and animals that don't have backbones. Like, um, but there's loads of different phylums in the animal kingdom. So, you could, so immediately you're starting to split things up like a horse has a backbone. So it would be in this phylum, a uh, woodlouse doesn't have a backbone, so it'd be in a different phylum. And plants as well, they've got different phylums and the fungi's got different phylums as well. But then obviously, there's all animals with backbones, that's not really whittling it down, is it? So then he made up classes and split the animals with backbones into different classes and the animals that didn't have backbones into different classes. You see what I mean? And then within those classes, um, you've got different orders and within the orders you've got different families and within the families you've got different genus and within the genus finally you get to the species which is the actual animal. I'm just going to give you this sheet. I think it'll it'll make sense and help you work it out if I just show you this. Here we go. So we're important to note, okay, I've written all the groups out here, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. Uh, the example that we're using is just the animal kingdom, but don't forget there's loads of other kingdoms. There's all the plants and all the fungi in different kingdoms. Um, what I'd like to do is you've got some animals here, or no, I shouldn't say that. You've got some organisms here. And I want you to put these organisms 
as low down this Linnaean system of classification as they can go. So here are the examples, right? Um, in the kingdom we're looking at is the like animal kingdom. The phylum is the chordata, which means they've got a backbone. The class is mammal, which means they've got fur. The order is carnivores. The family is the cat family, the felidae, with muscly body and curved, that should say claws, sorry. The genus is the panthera genus, so it can roar, like things that are in the cat family that can roar. And the species is anything that has a mane, so that would be a lion. So I've put one in for you. A sheep, um, it, it is an animal, so it's in the animal kingdom. Uh, it does have a backbone, so it's in the chordata phylum, uh, and it is a mammal, it's got fur. But a sheep isn't in the order carnivora, because a sheep doesn't eat other animals. So we the sheep we know is in the class mammal, but that's as far as we can go with these examples. Do you get it? So like a bird, where would a bird go? Is a bird an animal? If you think it is an animal, does a bird have a backbone? If you think it does have a backbone, does it have fur? If not, you just put it in the chordata phylum because it can't go any further. Is that okay? And then this is probably the important bit. This is the bit that I just can't do. Number two is, can you think of a sentence to help you remember this system? That, so think of a sentence that's seven words, that they all start with the letter that the group begins with. So like K and then P and then C and then O. I've had some brilliant examples given in previous lessons. I can't remember any of them. How are you getting on? Should we go through the answers? I hope you're coming up with some good sentences because we have got a GCSE question on this as well. Someone, what did Olivia say yesterday? Keep practicing cookies or family gets stressed, maybe? Keep practicing cookies or family gets stressed. I just, I can't even remember that sentence, let alone the order. Anyway, here we go. Right, a bird. Where have you put bird? Well, a bird is an animal. It's not a plant, is it? And it's not a fungus. So a plant is, uh, a bird is an animal. A bird does have a backbone. Oh, it doesn't have any fur. So a bird is in the phylum chordata, but it's not in the mammal class. It must be in a different class. What about a snail? Uh, a snail is an animal, yes. Does it have a backbone? Uh, no, it doesn't. So we can say that snail is in the animal kingdom, but it must be in a different phylum. Um, a tiger. What about a tiger? Well, a tiger is definitely an animal. It does have a backbone. It does have fur. Um, it definitely eats other animals. It's a carnivore. It's in the Felidae family, the cat family. It's got a muscly body and curved claws. And tigers can roar as well. But tigers don't have manes. They're not lions. You can't have two of the same species. That would be that would make sense. So we'll put tiger in the genus Panthera, but it's not a lion species, okay? The lion obviously goes at the bottom. It ticks all the boxes. Well done, lion. Uh, a cheetah, we learned about this when we did a big cat show ages ago. They're, they're in the cat family, but they can't roar. So a cheetah is an animal with a backbone that has fur. It's in the order of carnivora and it's in the cat family, the Felidae family. But it doesn't get to be in the panthera genus because it can't draw. Oh, uh, Plant, that's kind of there to trick you. I hope you didn't put plant anywhere. Go away, plant. Because plants are in a different kingdom. They're not in the animal kingdom. A seal, just learned this. Yeah, it's an animal. It's got a backbone. It has fur, actually. Um, it's, and it's a carnivore. It eats other animals. It's obviously not in the cat family. That would be weird. Uh, cows... They're mammals, like sheep, but they, they don't eat other animals. Uh, weasels are like seals. Weal weasels are carnivores, but they don't have the muscly body and the curved claws that puts them in the cat family. And a fish, you've all seen the little cartoon fish skeletons, right? So fish have backbones. They're in the chordata phylum, but they're not mammals. And zebras uh, are mammals that have fur, yes, but they're not carnivores. So cows, sheep, and zebras or mammals, 
not carnivores, so in the class mammal. Cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to look on my Facebook page in a minute because I've put a, a post up there saying if you would like to comment on this lesson, then you can. If you've come up with seven words that will help me remember the order of this, please write them there. I think keep practicing cookies or family gets stressed is the best one. The problem is I've heard so many now that I'm getting them all confused and I can't remember which word is which. Okay. Um, I should say as well that in the 90s, the 90s, um, we suddenly looked at all these kingdoms and went, uh, what about like bacteria though? Or things that are... Well, anyway, we had to put a different category above kingdom, which is the domain. You might have heard of the domain. It doesn't often, most of the things that we know that we deal with in everyday life are in one of the kingdoms. But there are some things that aren't in any of these kingdoms that had to go in a different domain. You can look it up if you want to. I'm not going to bother thinking of a sentence that starts with a D. But this is already doing my head in, frankly. Okay, so let's talk quickly about scientific names. You probably know this, that we give things its common name, don't we? Like a little bird, we would call it a wren, but a scientist might call it, what is it, like troglodyte, troglodyte or something. Um, it, a scientific name is two words. Where do they come from? Well, I will tell you. The, the proper word for the scientific name is the binomial name. Um, and it comes from this classification system we've just looked at. So the scientific name for a lion is Panthera leo, and the scientific name for a tiger is... Panthera tigris. Where have these names come from? You might be able to see it. So the Panthera at the beginning of the binomial name, the scientific name, is the genus name. So if you remember, can I go back? Yeah. Oops. Ah, oh no. Oh, I knew I'd, you should never ever go back on a PowerPoint. Just don't do it, okay? That's a hot tip from me. But you could, right, you remember that tigers and lions were both in the genus Panthera, but they're different species. So Panthera goes at the start of both their names because they're both in the genus Panthera. Uh, and then it's the species name that's different. So that's how you tell the difference, right, between like a lion and a tiger. Um, now, the rule is, and again, I just can't remember it. The, it's so simple. The rule is for the scientific name, you write them all the words in italics and the first word is capitalised. I mean, that, obviously that makes sense. The, just the first letter of the first word is a capital letter. So if this... Leo was a capital L, that would be wrong. If it wasn't all in italics, that would be wrong. But every single time I write a science magazine to post to my supporters, I always have to write Tyrannosaurus Rex. And I never can remember whether it's capital letter at the beginning or on both the words or whether one of them's in I don't know. Anyway, I'm hoping that by teaching you this, I will now remember. Um, okay, a quick note. I didn't know this before I started teaching this lesson, I am kind of getting two scientific subjects confused here. <clears throat> um, the study of classifying things is taxonomy. Tax, not taxidermy, which is stuffing dead animals. No, the study of classifying things is taxonomy, but the study of how animals evolved and their relationships is phylogeny. But nowadays, taxonomy, the classifying, is based on the phylogeny just in case there's any experts, like any adults in the room, touching going, she doesn't know a taxonomy from a phylogeny, this one. <laughs> well, I do. It's not that I don't know, it's that I don't care. All right, a real example, just before we go, of why classifying is important. Have you ever heard of the flat back turtle? Just wanted to show you a picture and give you this as a genuine example of why I'm not just telling you this because school said I had to. The flat back turtle, you might not have heard of it, because until the late 80s, we thought it was a kind of green turtle. And then we suddenly realised that we had it wrong. It wasn't just a different kind of green turtle. It was a whole different species called a flatback turtle. Look, thank you, seaturtlestatus.org. Um, here it is. It only lives around the coast of Australia. Isn't it cute? A beautiful little thing. Here's a map that they've given us. It doesn't live in very many places of the world. Um, and we don't know if it's endangered or not. Because until we've collected all the data on how many turtles there are, but we were, we were just counting green turtles. And suddenly it turns out there's a different kind of turtle. And all the numbers for that turtle, the flatback, are mixed up with the numbers for the green turtle. So if you can't prove how many flatback turtles there are, you can't prove that it's endangered. And if you can't prove that it's endangered, it's very hard to ask people for help, right? It's hard to say to the government, we need some money to save the flatback turtle. They'd be like, do you? Do you though? 
prove it. So yeah, a real life example of how classifying things incorrectly can cause all kinds of problems. Okay, are you ready for your GCSE questions? I am. I'm quite pleased with them. So I'm going to give you them. First of all, a quick note that if you are enjoying these, oh no, yeah, I want to talk about this as well. Um, a, a quick note that if you're not supporting me and you are enjoying what I do, then you can support me. You can send me five or six pounds a month. And everyone is sending me five or six pounds a month. There's enough people that I can do a home ed lesson like this every week and an IGCSE lesson every week and a show the Lego story time every week during term times and even be able to send you Theatre Science magazine, which is brilliant. It's such a good magazine. It's the best science magazine for children that I know of because I read all the other ones and I, I found problems with all of them, so I wrote my own. It's got a beautiful comic. It's got a, this one's on seed, so it's got a quiz about uh, which seed are you, a personality quiz. It's got an origami um, lotus and it's just got loads of articles that I'm just trying to like lay out information clearly instead of like facts, cool facts, because I don't know, my brain doesn't like facts. It likes information in order. So that is what you get with Theatre Science magazine. If you sign up now, I'll send you that one. And then on Monday, the new one arrives at my house and I'll send you that one too. Okay, add over. Oh yeah, a quick note of warning, just before we do our GCSE question then. If you've watched the previous lessons this term, we've been doing like how to think scientifically. If you've watched the previous lessons, can you think of a word? It was even the title of one of the previous lessons to describe this classifying system, the Linnaeus system of classifying organisms. What's a good word to describe this? You might be saying diagram, yeah? That is a word. Uh, the word that I was thinking of was uh, model. We've been looking at how scientific models can be drawings or actual things you hold in your hand. A scientific model helps you to understand things. So this is a model and we looked at in the model lesson how models simplify things which can be really good because it really helps us to understand them but it also can be a bit dangerous because it makes you believe things that aren't true like i'd never learned enough biology to know that this actually isn't like totally true because obviously all the phylums are kind of neatly lined up here so it sort of makes it look like all these things appeared on earth at the same time and evolved in the same way it's it's massively oversimplified. Some scientists think we shouldn't even be using this. But it's sort of a bit late now. Like you find, you discover a new creature on Earth. You've got to put it into one of the phylums. You can't make up a new phylum. So some phylum have got really ridiculously different creatures in them. And some phylum might only have like one or two animals. Uh, so yeah, just a note of, word of warning. It's not perfect. Um, some people are trying to change it. Right, here's your GCSE questions. <clears throat> Complete the sentence. This is a good one. This is a toughie. Complete the sentence by choosing two words from the box. So the sentence is, a family is a group of... Oh, no. Oh, no. What a melon. I've written the answers in. Oh, hopefully you didn't see it. Just covering it up. Oh, teachers hate it when that happens. Got it. I wrote the answers in for the others uh, yesterday. Ah, humbug. Right. Ugh, here we go. I'm just going to pretend that that didn't happen. <laughs> um, a family is a group of similar something but be that belong to the classification group below something. And the words you can choose are species, animals, order, organisms or kingdom. <laughs> ah. A family is a group of similar, is it species, animals, order, organisms or kingdom? That belong to the classification group below, is it species, animals, order, organisms or kingdom? Two, Pitchard is a famous dinosaur. What letter shows the correct way to write its binomial name? So A says Tyrannosaurus rex with a capital T, all in italics. B says Tyrannosaurus rex, all in italics with no capitals. C says Tyrannosaurus rex, no capitals, no italics. And D says Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, T is capital, rex isn't, and rex is in italics. Which one is the right way to write Tyrannosaurus rex? I know. And I'm going to write it in my next magazine. I'm still going to have to search it online just to check. And your summary question. I've been a bit kind here. I think I should be a bit more specific. Um, write down three living things and explain why they are in the same category. I've said you may want to use the words below to help you. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. You should definitely use those words. And I want you to do this three times, actually. Can you write three different groups of animals and tell me why you've put them in the same group. So I've put, for example, like lion, tiger, lioness. 
because all those animals are in the genus Panthera. That's what they've got in common. Okay, <laughs> should we go through? Should we go through the answer to the first two? Since you might have seen the answer anyway. So this first one, this is a great tricksy question, because a lot of people in the Facebook lesson were writing uh, a family is a group of similar animals. Now that might be true if it's the animal kingdom at the top, then the family would all be animals. But it's not necessarily animals, is it? Um, it could be the plant kingdom, a family within the plant kingdom. So it's organisms, isn't it? Organisms. A family is a group of similar organisms, like living things, yeah, but it could be fungi or animal or plant that belong to the classification group below. Oh, I've just got it written here. So family is below order. So it's order. Well done if you got that right. That was solid. And the right way to... The correct way to write Tyrannosaurus rex is A, all capitals, no, sorry, all italics and capital at the start. All capitals, all italics, capital at the start, just capital letter at the start. I mean, who can't remember that? And I'm going to go to Facebook and see if any of you have written your uh, list of things. Some people were writing, uh, I don't know, like cat, dog, squirrel and saying that they were all mammals, that kind of thing that I would get down with. <laughs> right, I'll put you back up here now. All right, you lot, that is the end of the lesson. Except, yes, I'm going to go to my Facebook page now and just see if any of you have written me any comments. Um, I'm putting the science show with the Lego story time, which I did this morning on Facebook, onto YouTube at two o'clock. If you want to come along to that and look at a, a, a Lego story time about spit. I did learn a lot though, it was interesting. Um, and then that's repeated if you haven't seen my show with the Lego story time this week yet, which is all about the mouth. Why do we not replace our teeth constantly, but sharks do? What is the inside of your mouth made of? Right, seriously, what is that? Why is it slimy? If you want to learn all about that and watch the Lego story time on Spit, then be on YouTube at two o'clock today or Facebook at 10 o'clock on Monday. Or just come back to YouTube like whenever you like and it'll be here. I'll save it for you, as always. Any comments? Oh, hello, Bella. It's okay, we had already answered the question. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, because you get the sheet from my Facebook group. Great class. Oh, we're new. Oh, new people. No way, Rachel. I am amazed. I didn't... <laughs> I'd like the teaching side. The whole kind of organising with, like, the telling people what to do thing. I'm not so great at. I can't believe that Rachel and fam managed to find this on YouTube and find my Facebook page. Congratulations. <laughs> great to meet you. Kingdom plants can offer fungi gentle sheep. Oh, Abby, what? Kingdom plants can offer fungi gentle sheep. Okay, Abby, you know that I love and respect you, so we know each other well enough for me to say, no, what are you doing? You can offer fungi gentle sheep. That makes no sense. You love the cactus wallpaper. Thank you, Bella. <laughs> All right, what's Bella got? Katie pooed carefully on fish Galileo stick. You're really helping you lot. <laughs> Katie pooed carefully on fish Galileo stick. Kingdom plants. King uh, Katie pooed carefully on fish gentle sheep. No, I don't know. That's not doing it for me. But anyway, I'm glad to meet Rachel. The rest of you. I feel like you've just you just come along to confuse me even further. Thank you so much for watching, you lot. I will see you. Oh, uh, yeah, next week, which is the last week before York schools take a week off for half term. So we've got one more uh, home edge, one more physics IGCSE lesson, and one more Lego science show next week, and then I'll be finished for a week. All right, see you very soon. Thank you so much for coming.